Welcome to Expert Opinion, the branding business forum where leaders share their views, insights, and experiences from the world of B2B branding. And now, here's your host. Hello, I'm Ryan Rikas, and today's show is titled Best Practices for Branding Early Stage Companies. Today's guest is Dave Burkett, a globally experienced entrepreneur having built and sold many companies. Dave is one of America's most prolific angel investors with over 190 early stage technology investments to date. Dave's also the author of 14 books on early stage business building. His Bur- <clears throat> excuse me, his Burkitt method valuing pre-revenue companies has been used by over 1 million entrepreneurs and investors and he shares his insights weekly via Burkinomics.com with over 4, 400,000 readers per month. Dave manages six early-stage investment funds, primarily focused on technology companies. So as an expert in startup companies, mergers and acquisitions, and positioning companies for liquidity events, I think you'll enjoy what Dave has to say. Dave, welcome to Expert Opinion. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Well, clearly you're an expert on evaluating and advising entrepreneurs on early-stage businesses. So I've heard you say that no business plan survives its first experience in the market. So on that topic, can you give our listeners um, a viewpoint on how early stage companies should think about its initial business plan and the reality that it needs to be flexible according to the reactions that it receives in the market? So the important thing for me is I've seen over, I guess, 10,000 plans over the years. I saw three yesterday alone, uh, is to try and find the idea that is the core and then try and figure out the total available market, the serviceable available market, and uh, finally, uh, the uh, addressable available market. And it isn't easy because most entrepreneurs don't know the terms and don't know how to find them. And so they overcomplicate their presentation. So I'm looking for a couple of things. First is one that's not in the presentation, but rather in the presenter, and that is the enthusiasm for whatever it is the person is presenting. And second, I want a core idea that I think will service a total available market well enough with a services a serviceable available market that would get the company to about twenty million dollars or more at the end of the fifth year as a run rate, and that lets out an awful lot of the ideas that come over my desk. So uh, there are those requirements and uh, several more that make it easy for me to filter very fast when I see all of these what ten thousand plans. So I like the idea there of what you mentioned the uh, the core idea which. Um in our terms, would really be this brand, you know, um, what the company right. stands for, how it's relevant to a target audience, how it differentiates, and how is, what is the most compelling way to say that story in the fewest amount of words possible to give a, a, a viewer uh, a very, very clear understanding of the value proposition. Would, would, is that similar to what, how you would describe it? Yeah, in fact, you know, everybody talks about uh, the mission, vision, and values. And uh, it goes further and sometimes talk about uh, the uh, idea, the strategies, and the tactics. I want to start with something very much easier so that uh, the listener, and in my case the investor, can understand the business in a single sentence. And so you hit on something really important. I call it the mantra. That's something that isn't typical in marketing lingo. But a mantra is a single sentence that usually takes a small business a lot of time to figure out but I want them to tell me in one sentence what they do. And the best way to do that is to find another business I recognize and then associate with that name. For example, uh, you have a bicycle delivery service in Orange County, and so you want to be able to have uh, 100 bicycle delivery people out there at all times. And so your mantra might be, we are the FedEx of bicycle delivery in Orange County. And right away, I know because of FedEx's reputation, kind of what they're trying to do. And from there, it's very easy for me to fit all the rest of the talk and the slides and sometimes the off-subject talk directly into what it is they're trying to tell me. And what percentage of um, initial pitches do you think do a good job in delivering that clear value proposition? Actually, very few. Uh, (laughs) It uh, usually takes somebody who's been coached to be able to get Mm -hmm. into that position. And there is coaching available from places like uh, SCORE and TriTech and other places, TriNet, that uh, allow 
uh, the entrepreneur the chance to be able to try out first. It uh, isn't common. And so sometimes I have to ferret out the core from a presentation that is mostly technical. And it's true that most of the people presenting to me uh, end up presenting a presentation that is technical when I want to know much more about the market and the availability and the uniqueness of the product. So after that, um, that first core idea, then, then you are hooked as a, um, as a listener, um, as a possible investor. Um, now a number of questions start to emerge, and then you have to go deeper, of course, in, into the value proposition. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that, because uh, I think our listeners would appreciate that point of view. As a brand strategy firm, we, we do some startups, but the majority of our work is with corporations who have been around for a while that need to rebrand for a number of reasons, whether it's mergers and acquisitions or uh, industry roll-up or just the, the company's evolved. Um, but when I'm asked by early-stage um, founders, they often ask me, Ryan, when should I think about brand strategy? And, of course, they have an opinion about that, but let me get your opinion first. Well, first of all, if you don't have a brand strategy, you're one of the many. And that's one of the problems that I get is because often I see many presentations that are ideas that have been uh, used and in some cases very successfully by other firms and coming in fifth or sixth with an idea with very little money behind it is not a strategy <laughs> that I would expect <laughs> somebody to have. So a brand strategy for me is uh, I coach them if I have time to coach them uh, because I like their core idea into thinking of three ways of looking at this. Uh, I call it IDC. Uh, first of all, increase revenues, decrease costs, and then customers and more customers. So IDC. And if they can fit themselves into one of those three, then I can hear much more and believe much more about what they can do. So it's you know, in brand strategy terms, not something that is typical. Ordinarily, you hear much more about uh, North, West, South, East, needs, wants, uh, security, education. It goes on and on. But this is a much easier one for a young entrepreneur to understand. They either increase revenues, decrease costs, or they better serve their customers. So that's one of those gets to the heart of the value proposition, right? Has to. Yeah, and okay. uh, often it, you have to tease out the valuable proposition from uh, these people and find out, what their intent is, because most of these small companies, even if they're financed fairly well at the early stage, should be co focusing almost all of their money on the core. Uh, right. They should be hiring people from the core or for their core, and uh, then they can rent out the rest, and there are so many. Absolutely. Yeah, um, so our experience is that once, we, once we've done the research, the strategy, the positioning, um, it really allows – um, and gives the gift of focus. So if you, you can avoid all the other distractions and the shiny objects and all the things that would pull you and your energy and your money and your time away from uh, the, the core value proposition. And just stay, if you can stay focused on that, it, it just adds um, so many gifts of, of time and um, probably a lot of direction for the, the lean amount of uh, resources that they have. So on, on that, that thought, perfectly. Mm -hmm. okay, good. Well, um, on that thought, um, I did mention research, and um, I, I know there's a number of different schools of th I've thought around this, whether you just go to market and then your research is actually the, the marketplace's reaction to your value proposition, or you do a certain amount of research in advance to um, understand what the market's looking for. And I know the answer is it depends, <laughs> but what, do you, what is your thought about doing some level of um, audience research to uh, validate the business model and, and kind of guide some of the messaging? I don't know if you've ever heard of the Berkus method of valuation, but uh, it's been used by over a million entrepreneurs since 1996 when I developed it. Uh, it was uh, kind of blessed and became famous when Howard Stevenson of Harvard published a book called Winning Angels way back before the term angel was really well known. And uh, he used something I had been using for two years and elevated it in the book into something very important. And from that point on, you'll find over 300,000 references to it now if you Google Berkus Method. And what I've done is to take the simplest possible way of evaluating a company. 
And the reason I bring all this up is because one of those is the core idea and what's it worth. And the second one is have you a strategic partner or some way of validating what you've done? And that could be from wireframes. It can be from uh, initial drawings. It can be from just uh, proposing the idea to somebody who uh, would be willing to buy if the idea turns into a reality. And that's uh, worth about a quarter of the value of a company if they've taken the time to do that. Wow. So you can tie it definitely back to um, uh, financial valuation. And that's what I'm trying to say. And there are two others. One is the quality of the management team that uh, would get the company to profitability, which is a proxy for success, or at least a proxy for stability. And uh, that's an important one, too. And the final one is technology. Have they actually developed the product, or are they just dreaming it? And dreaming it sometimes means they'll tell you they can do it in six months when it takes three years, and they run out of money again and again. So mm -hmm. there are four basic elements of early pre-revenue uh, valuation that can get a company to a value of 2 and a half to $4 million, depending on if they hit all of them right. Well, Dave, before we move on, how would, do, would our listeners find this Ber Berkus method? Uh, just uh, Google it, and you'll find it anywhere. We're actually turning it into something new that uh, won't be out for another month. But uh, I gave a keynote on the Berkus method in Orange County about two weeks ago. And there were 200 people in the room, and I asked how many would be interested in paying for a certification where I actually did the uh, certification and the valuation. And 10% of them raised their hand, and that was enough for me. So we're building a website for them to upload information, and uh, there's a medallion that goes with the final valuation. And I will do the valuation for these people to kind of help the investor candidates to understand how the value was derived. And I just gave you the four elements. Perfect. Well, I think I already know the answer to my question here then, but um, hmm. in terms of is this, this research and this um, validation, it seems to be pretty valuable to potential investors, right? It builds confidence and assurance. That's true. And the one thing that is difficult for me to find independently is the total available market. A minute ago, I talked about Tam Sam Song, and mm -hmm. uh, if you're familiar with the three terms, total available market, we all know, and sure. usually the uh, entrepreneur will invent a number or have found a number through research, but then what is serviceable? In other words, what portion of that market does their product actually cover? And then the most important one is obtainable. Uh, with the resources they have, how much of that market can they really obtain? And that's something they really can't figure out. What I often get is uh, what I will call the Chinese glove syndrome. If there are 1.4 billion people in China and each has two hands, then I can sell 2.8 billion gloves. All I need to sell is just 1% of that, and I'll be rich. It doesn't say anything. It doesn't tell me anything about market research, nor does it tell me anything about their ability to get 1%. Very good point. Well, you mentioned earlier um, topics around purpose, vision, mission, values, and those type of things. Um, mm -hmm. we, we help our clients develop. We, these are what we call guiding statements. And um, mm -hmm. once again, primarily working with existing companies with you know, a workforce from 50 to 5,000 to 20,000 people, um, they become very important to really align and inspire these internal teams. Uh, but we've also developed these statements to provide clarity, um, in a, an additional layer of clarity <clears throat> around the organization, where it's going, how it's going to get there, what it stands for, why it exists. And we found that some of the investors also appreciate that uh, clarity of direction. Uh, what is your thought? Absolutely. Uh, sometimes, as I said, you have a technologist that gets deep into the technology without realizing that the investor has already lost it. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to know in the first minute what it is that's important about the offering, or we kind of tune out. We give the uh, entrepreneur, once they've gotten through the initial submission and in our interest, 15 minutes at the most, sometimes only 12, to tell us the entire story. And the rest of it is our grilling them after that time. And if they can't uh, mold their story into that short a period of time, 
then they really haven't thought out not only their value proposition, but the process. Right. I think TED Talk was uh, modeled after this um, example, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to develop this compelling presentation in, what, 12 minutes or less? So It's 18 uh, minutes, and uh, it is, I don't know, uh, frightening. <laughs> because, uh, the one I gave, uh, gave uh, went to 17 minutes, and I think it was 40 seconds. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you rehearse and you rehearse and you rehearse, and when you stand in front of everybody, you end up uh, not using your rehearse script, but rather just talking to the subject. It's a lot of fun, but it uh, is frightening. Well, I watched that TED Talk, and you had a commanding presentation, so well done. Thank you. So speaking of that, you've heard probably more pitches than anyone has ever. <laughs> so what makes I don't that know if that's true, pitch? but there are a lot. What usually means is it's a bigger firm than I'm a one-person firm, although I do manage a fund with five partners. The pitches come to me first. And so, uh, yeah, you're right. It is uh, something to filter very quickly, yes or no. So give me. do you have an example of one of the best you've ever heard? Our, our listeners love stories, so... Um, Oh, I have many examples, far too many for the Good. program. My favorite one has to go back uh, 19 years. Do you allow me to do that? Sure. Okay, so it was in the year late 1999, right before the crash of 2000. Steve Street, who uh, was a radio uh, disc jockey, came to the Tech Coast Angels and made a presentation about how he wanted to create a way in which people could pay for uh, Internet items without having uh, to have a credit card, because kids don't have credit cards. That was the uh, concept, and it was developed because he and two friends had uh, been talking to the head of Interactive for Disney. This goes back way back when. And so I invested the largest amount, uh, other than his next-door neighbor, a woman who loaned him 300000 uh, bucks, in the idea, knowing that there was going to be a pivot, that that wasn't enough. There was no way that just having some way for kids to pay for uh, trinkets within applications on the Internet. And it turned out that uh, very shortly thereafter, Steve pivoted uh, and renamed the company and turned into what was the first debit card. And you'll recognize the name Green Dot because it's at every store in the world, it seems. It's in 75,000 stores in this country alone. And Green Dot is the inventor of the debit card. It is the largest debit card company. And the pivot was to be able to serve the underserved who couldn't have bank accounts and sometimes no checking accounts. And so with those types of changes, that company has become monstrous. And you know that they had a public offering uh, 11 years ago, 10 years ago. And uh, I was the largest uh, seller in that public offering at 3.5% of the entire offering. But uh, there is the ideal pivot. He recognized his market was too thin. He pivoted toward a, an idea that created uh, an infinitely large market and is executing and has been executing. He is still the CEO. One of my favorite stories. Well, I can see why you like it so much. You're a great financial gain on that one. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have time for another story. Another, you have another example of a, a, a great uh, pitch and, and, and how they went forward? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Uh, it goes back uh, quite a bit of time, too, but it's another Orange County company as well. And the pitch was, uh, we design web uh, systems or web applications. And that wasn't interesting to me. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the eight of us who are in this company stop and play Internet games. We have a million people playing using the software that we've licensed. And that was interesting to me. And so uh, I was able to be the first investor in that company, uh, change its name and its focus uh, to just this million users. Uh, by the time we did that, we were up to 4 million users. And uh, we increased the value of that company to a point where we were worth half a billion dollars within 14 months. Uh, then came the crash. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up taking four or five more years to sell the company at a lesser amount, but a great, great profit. And it all came because uh, the pitch was innocent, disorganized, but really powerful as far as the way in which he's proven his product. So is it uh, the 
founder the CEO that you buy into or his management team or the technology or, you know, kind of give me an understanding of uh, what you're looking for there. Okay. So in the Berkus method, the management team is another 25% of value. And we mentioned that okay. they can get you to mm-hmm. profitability, which is mm-hmm. the proxy for stability. So I look for the jockey, not the horse. And this has become okay. for us early stage investors uh, so trite that I almost am afraid to say it. But it means that we're looking for the management team or the entrepreneur to be able to shine with his passion and ability to execute far above everything else. Again, because everybody pivots. Right. Well, um, no matter what size the company, we have, a, I think, a pretty similar belief that uh, the brand needs to be owned by the CEO, not the marketing department. Uh, you know, the brand is, uh, you know, in simple terms, the entire corporation organization's um, reputation, and that needs to be protected uh, very carefully and communicated very clearly. And marketing and sales can make a brand promise, but um, uh, the rest of the organization needs to keep it. And the CEO is the one that needs to be the evangelist communicating it very clearly. So sounds like you agree. Oh, very much. And remember, I'm dealing with early stage businesses entirely. So many of them have no brand. And uh, they're usually attempting to emulate somebody else's brand. That's not necessarily the right way to do this. And they never tested their brand, which makes it even more difficult. So some of the names of these companies and these brands uh, would embarrass me to tell you about at the same time as I know that, again, there will be changes along the way, name changes for companies, name changes for brands. And then you heard in my first story about Steve Street, name changes for products. Right. Well, when we do our branding, we try to tell our clients that consistency and continuity equal clarity. And first, let's get that very concise story prepared and then tell it consistently and continually. Um, So let's just chat just a a bit about um, storytelling and and, uh, because Mm -hmm. people relate more to the emotional connection of a brand actually than the the very rational side. So um, what are your thoughts around developing that very, very clear and concise brand story? Well, first of all, I tell everybody if they don't have any kinds of testimonials, whether it is from people who say, I will use it when you complete it, down to saying, people, I've used your product and it's the best thing I've ever seen. There has to be some sort of testimonial to prove that somebody from the outside has validated the brand. Without that, then it's just talk. So uh, I do coach them to find somebody. And remember the, uh, the idea of having some kind of a strategic customer or supplier or somebody is one of the elements of the value. So uh, I like to talk to them about going viral, but that doesn't come in the first conversation. It comes mm-hmm. if I'm interested enough to be able to help coach as well as invest. And going viral to me ends in the pivot, but starts in, the uh, planning, whatever they have decided to plan. It goes into how many channels do you plan to distribute through? Because if you're going to create a website and expect the world to come to it, I'm not interested in investing in you. Because there's nobody that has enough money to do just that, to cut through the noise and bring people to a single website to market. So we need multiple channels, and uh, they've got to figure out a way of distributing their product, service, or app through multiple channels, many. I have one company that has 150 different channels. Wow. And third is the cost tested. Can somebody uh, tell me that people will pay the amount that you plan to charge however you're doing it? And there are so many ways of charging for a product that the brand is very much dependent upon the price, the way in which people look at the brand, uh, whether it's going to be a luxury brand or a low-cost brand or uh, a brand that... uh, demands people thinking that it is uh, uh, high cost, therefore it must be high value, and on and on. And then I want them to measure, and then I want the reaction to that measurement so that I can begin to see the uh, data that comes from it. And finally, obviously, from our conversation a minute ago, what will you do as a result of what you found? And the answer is always a pivot. And it sounds like, especially with early stage um you have to pivot early and, and possibly often just to react to the market conditions. And that's, I guess, the beauty of uh, the world we're in today with technology and the digital transformation. You're able to get 
the answer, answers and these insights to the reaction to the value proposition very quickly and be able to adjust accordingly. So exactly. um, are there any other technologies or digital tools or um, distribution uh, thoughts that you, that you find to be real effective, or is it just always case by case? It is case by case, but it's so easy today to be able to divide the mailing list, if that's how you're going to start, into uh, small elements and make different offering propositions to each, just like you would if you were a big company. But most of these uh, small entrepreneurs have never done this before and don't know how to. So again, it is after I have uh, fallen in love with the company and the entrepreneur that I have to begin to teach these kinds of things that you already know and that larger companies have already internalized. Well, Dave, we've, we've spoken about um, research, the ability, you know, the opportunity and ability to reach the target audience and get their reaction uh, initially and on an ongoing basis, the ability to develop a clear and concise story, the importance of developing a, um, a branded value proposition, guiding statements. Uh, you mentioned some naming examples, and we do naming for many clients. Um, yeah. As you know, it's very difficult to find legally available names today, and and when we create them, they're usually fairly obscure uh, because mm-hmm. those are the ones that are legally available. And then we have to de- develop a uh, visual identity to reflect the value proposition. I know this all comes later after the things I mentioned earlier, but just what are your thoughts on developing the, the verbal and visual branding elements? First of all, I'm sold on what you just said. <laughs> so okay. I should repeat it and say that that is something that I would love to internalize. Uh, and have each of these entrepreneurs internalize. Uh, they often will come with a brand that they've invented that is some kind of a combination of terms that are uh, technical. And so you find names that uh, just don't seem to fall off your tongue, but they're names that they think have high value because they were derived through some form of uh, analysis of their product. So. I'm not sure I want to talk much more about naming propositions because that is one of the uh, sore points that I often come across. Companies that have either names of the company or more likely the brand that uh, just aren't going to be remembered by those who are your target audience. Right. Well, I guess just one piece of advice for the listeners, and you you mentioned it, Uh, if you come up with a technical name, often as your company pivots and evolves, that name it becomes no longer relevant. So that's actually when we're brought in quite often is to change names that have outgrown themselves. Uh, the company's changed and the name is holding it back. So that is um, that is one piece of advice we give our listeners. It sounds like both of us agree that the technical names are not effective. It, you're better off with a more of a evocative name that you can give meaning to and evolve and uh, grow with, and that becomes much more effective. Let me expand that to say that uh, I kind of teach them that everything changes from concept to release. And if they're not really ready to know that, internalize that, and make those changes as they discover things, then uh, it's not somebody I want to associate with or invest in. And if that's true, I want them to find somebody who is willing to be their teacher customer, the customer that feeds back to them what the customer needs, where they're in a listening mode, the entrepreneur is in the listening mode, and that the customer begins to uh, help to develop the product by association because they're so interested in what might be the result that they're willing to spend the time. And in branding and marketing, often that is where the real truth comes out. customer says, I understand what you're trying to do, but I don't understand the way in which you're trying to tell me about it. Very well said. Well, Dave, we're almost out of time. Uh, You've been a great guest. really appreciate the insights uh any final thoughts or insights that you can share with the with our listeners uh, i guess uh in the case of uh branding i have to go into marketing and uh the three biggest questions that uh again i've taught because i think that the most important are why buy it why buy mine why buy now and if the sales and marketing department can figure out the answers to that in a single sentence or two they have uh, a much higher opportunity to close the sale. And that ties in branding with marketing with sales. Perfect. Great advice. Well, Dave, thank you for being a guest today. Um, Really appreciate it. 
And if mm-hmm. listeners wanted to reach you, how would they go about reaching you? Well, if they go to Berkus.com, B-E-R-K-U-S, like Sam, dot com, they'll find several things. Uh, and there are there's lots of content there as well, including videos. And they can also subscribe to my weekly newsletter, uh, which gives one of these ideas we've talked about each week. And, uh, gee, there's uh, 600 of them on there already. But every Tuesday morning at uh, 8.30, a new one comes into their mailbox. And so uh, well, that's where, gee, 200,000 people a week get that. So it's not well, a I would way agree, and I ideas. endorse that greatly. I, um, I follow it on a weekly basis. So um, Thank you. You've been on my list for some time, Dave, to get in touch with her. I knew you'd have uh, a great point of view, so I really appreciate you sharing today. And, um, yeah, listeners, this concludes our show for today. This is Ryan Rikus, and you've been listening to another edition of Expert Opinion, a brand new business forum where thought leaders share their point of view. If you'd like to listen to past shows or read our blog series, visit brandingbusiness.com. Until our next show, grow your business by living your brand promise.